On October 11, 2002, it was a beautiful fall day, and it was finally Friday, so Luther Whitson decided to launch his boat into Boone Lake in order to relax and have a day of fishing. Boone Lake is located in Washington County, Tennessee, and in the fall, trout disperse from the local rivers into the headwaters at Boone. Luther figured he could catch him a few trout for dinner. He was kicked back, enjoying the sun hitting his face as he fished when he noticed something floating in the distance that resembled a Halloween mask. He turned on his trolling motor to ease into it a bit closer and leaned down to perhaps grab the mask and get a better look. But when he looked over the edge of his boat, he realized that it was not a mask at all, but a head floating in the water. Luther headed to shore in order to call 911. The next day, Edward Baker was participating in a fishing tournament on Boone Lake when a human hand went floating by him. So he grabbed the hand with his fishing net and brought it on shore. He then called 911. Then later that same evening, yes, you guessed it, the other hand was found by a group of inmates picking up litter near the Devault Bridge on Boone Lake. During the same time as the inmates had found the hand on another part of the lake, Isaac Nichols, who was fishing with his daughter and nephew, found a piece of a human skull was a serial killer running rampant in Tennessee and dumping his victims into Boone Lake. Hello, my name is Holly, and this is the Murder She Shed, the place we honor the dead while getting our true crime addictions fed right from my she shed. Now smash that sexy subscribe button and you won't be disappointed. Mm -mm. <laughs> Teasing y'all, but you could smash it. My subscribe button anyway. One of my subscribers, Fonda, suggested this case. I'd actually never heard of it before, but it is an interesting case. In 2002, Adam Christmer, 17 years old, was the youngest of four children. Adam was a loving, caring, and very artistic boy, often doing impressions of Jim Carrey and Elvis. He could often be seen on people's porch shooting the bull. He was a talker and loved to help others. In August of 2002, Adam dropped out of school and married his childhood sweetheart, Samantha Lemming, when he was 17 and she was only 16. It is unclear why they got married so young. Samantha's brothers were friends with a girl named Kelly Willis. Samantha got to know Kelly through her brothers. They became good friends and Samantha then introduced her to Adam, who was just her boyfriend when they had met Kelly. Kelly's dad was a man named Howard Hawk Willis. I know I'm throwing a lot of names at you. So basically, Kelly's dad is Howard Hawk Willis, and Kelly is friends with Samantha and her soon-to-be husband, Adam. Hopefully you got that. I'm going to try to add some pictures. Of course, I don't have a picture of Kelly, but... Yeah, she kind of wants to stay private, and I can't blame her in this story. Now, let's discuss Kelly's dad, Howard Hawk Willis. Howard was on his second marriage when he was introduced to the young couple, Adam and Samantha. His second wife's name was Wilda. Wilda had known Howard since she was a child. He was her cousin, and they often played together as young children. Wilda's uncle was Howard's stepfather, so they were not biological cousins. So after Wilda divorced her first husband, she ended up marrying Howard. Yeah, they're not biological cousins, although it still seems kind of weird, but really they're not kin at all. I don't know. Seems like if you grew up saying this person was your cousin and you played with them as children, I just, I don't know, just feel like I wouldn't be attracted to them, but to each their own, right? Howard told Wilda that his first wife had ran off and left him, so he had to raise Kelly on his own. His first wife, Nancy Deborah Willis, had not ran off. She had went missing, but that is not what he had told Wilda. Howard and Nancy were in the process of a building a home in Bradley County, Tennessee, but Nancy disappeared before they could move in. She was last seen visiting her family for Christmas on December 1986 in Gate City, Virginia. She was supposed to head back home after the visit, but never made contact with her family again, which is unusual for her. 
Howard said the last time he had seen her was March of 1987, which was three months after her last contact with her family. According to Howard, she told him she was leaving him and he took her to a bus station in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It was said they were in a custody dispute over their children when she went missing, although it discusses children, all I could find as children was Kelly, and I'm not positive if Kelly's mom was Howard's missing ex-wife, or Kelly had a different mom. It's just not clear, but not really important. So Wilda ended up adopting Kelly at some point in their marriage. Howard was a truck driver and a huge mommy's boy. His mom, Betty, caused a lot of problems in Wilda and Howard's marriage. As Kelly became a teen, Howard started hanging out with Kelly and all of her teenage friends. Sometimes, when Wilda would come home from work, there would be teens drunk and passed out on the floor. Wilda found it strange that Howard was always hanging out with teens and supplying them with alcohol, and there was rumors he supplied them with drugs as well. After 14 years with Howard, she divorced him because she was just sick of his refusal to grow up and basically get friends his own age, and well, she found it creepy, and it is a bit creepy. Not long after the divorce, Wilda's uncle and Howard's stepfather, Sam Thomas, went missing in September 2002. Wilda and her uncle's family began looking for Sam, a 73-year-old retired fireman. Howard told everyone that Sam had taken his RV and went camping. The police did not feel Sam was in danger and would not help the family search. The family was able to find out that right after Sam went missing, someone had been using his credit card. Wilda went and confronted Howard after she found out that it had been him and the two married teens, Adam and Samantha, that had been using his card. He didn't deny and told Wilda that Sam had let him borrow the card in case he needed anything while he was gone. Wilda did not believe anything Howard was saying and left feeling that Howard definitely had something to do with Sam being missing. At this point, Adam and Samantha were living in Howard's trailer with him and his daughter Kelly. On October 4th, 2002, Adam called his mom upset and crying, and he said he wanted to come home, so his mom told him to come home, and he agreed to do so, but sadly, she would never see her son alive again. Adam had made the call from his landlord's trailer, and then the landlord had seen Howard walk over and tell Adam they needed to go, and according to Samantha's mom... As her and Samantha were inside eating pizza at Pizza Hut, Adam walked inside and told Samantha they needed to go because Howard was waiting. Samantha asked Adam, where is my dog? Apparently, they had been paying to have her dog boarded at a vet's office. Adam told her we didn't get it, to which Samantha responded by calling Kelly a b**** It isn't clear what Kelly had to do with getting the dog. Both Adam and Samantha went missing that night after being seen last in Howard's red jeep. It was realized the couple was missing after police were trying to find them in order to question them about Sam's credit cards. Howard had been on probation because of a past drug charge for hauling drugs in his truck from Texas to New York. So they decided to use this as a way to arrest him since they were suspicious of his involvement of the missing teens and also his stepfather. On October 11th, Howard was arrested, and the authorities asked Wilda if she would record her conversations with Howard since she was going to talk with him anyway about what had happened to her uncle, Sam. Wilda would learn things in these discussions that she could never imagine her ex-husband would do. But before the discussions had even started, the scattered human remains had been found in the lake. Then through the jailhouse taped cells between Howard and his mother Betty, they heard Howard say, Do the things I told you to do and get air freshener for that stinking house. Then on another call, Betty said, What do you want me to do with the furniture? Because it is padlocked in, which Howard responded, Because of the check. This made the authorities think that they could be talking about a storage unit they were renting and didn't make a payment on, so it had been locked. 
they started calling around to different storage rentals around in the area of Betty's home. Unit 47 had been rented in Betty's name, and before they even opened the door to the unit, maggots were seen crawling from the cracks out from under the door. When the door was slid open, the smell was overwhelming. They knew instantly that they would find bodies. Inside the storage unit, officers found two beige 50-gallon rubber-made storage containers covered with a blue tarp. Underneath the blue tarp, on top of the containers, they found a hammer, a hatchet, and a pair of scissors. The rubber-made containers were tied with yellow nylon rope. On top of the containers, there was a plastic bag containing five pop-top-style air freshener cans. Besides the container, on the floor were two large plastic fuel cans containing kerosene. TBI forensic investigators collected fingerprint samples from several objects in the unit, including the blue tarp that covered the containers. A fingerprint taken from the tarp was later matched to Howard's right thumb. When officers looked inside the storage containers, they found two human bodies. There was a female body in one container and a male body in the other, minus head and hands on the male. Both bodies were covered with layers of fabric, blankets, and pieces of carpet. The male body was also covered with a black coat that had a distinctive red plaid flannel lining. The bodies would be identified as Adam and Samantha. The container in which Samantha's body was found contained layers comprised of a pillow inside a pillowcase, two small rugs, and then Samantha's body. The body was nude, and there was a gag around Samantha's mouth. Each of her hands was bound with a plastic zip tie looped together behind her and then bound with a third zip tie. Each of her ankles was bound with a plastic zip tie as well, but those zip ties were not bound together. It does not mention that she had been SA'd, but with the description of how her body had been found, it would seem that she was to me. Discoloration of Samantha's extremities indicated that she was alive when she was bound. She sustained bruises to her right leg, to the inside of her right breast, to her right shoulder, and to her feet. The fatal wounds to Samantha were two G-U-N shot wounds to her head. After analysis of the insect's life cycles in the different containers, they believed that Samantha could have been alive a couple of days longer than Adam. The container in which Adam was found was layered with two throw rugs, a size XXX black jacket, and then Adam's body. The body was wrapped first in a blue comforter with sunflowers on it, and then a pink fleece blanket all tied up with black nylon rope. The black jacket had damage consistent with having been cut through with a chainsaw. Fibers embedded in the body, as well as bone fragments and tissue in the material, suggested that the body was wrapped when it was dismembered. Once unwrapped, Adam's body, minus his head and hands, was observed to be dressed in flannel boxer briefs and cargo shorts. His legs were cut through the bones, but the connective tissue remained intact. The legs of the shorts displayed chainsaw marks, and cuts on Adam's legs were consistent with those chainsaw marks. It appeared that Adam's legs were cut in order to fold his body into the rubber made container. Adam had also been shot in the head. The hands and head found in Boone Lake was Adam's. They then issued a search warrant for Betty's house. They found the matching pillowcase in her house that has been found with Samantha's body. Blood was also found inside of Howard's Jeep. Betty complained that They had taken everything out of the garage during the search, including a George Foreman grill. When Howard heard this, he said, What in the damn hell is a George Foreman grill evidence to? Betty responded, I don't know, Howard. We probably cooked the parts before we got rid of them. 
Wow, Betty, you win the Mother of the Year Award. They found numerous other evidence at Betty's house that tied her and Howard to the murder of these two teens. So while authorities recorded Wilda and Howard's conversation, Howard stated that he had blown Adam and Samantha's effing brains out, cut off Adam's head and hands, and threw them in the river near the Devault Bridge, then placed the remainder of Adam's body and all of Samantha's body in the storage units. He told Wilda it was because the two teens had killed and cut up her Uncle Sam's remains. Then he told Wilda exactly where to find the chainsaw that he had cut Adam up with, but he only told her this because he wanted her to sneak the chainsaw over to Samantha's brother's house so they could frame him for the murder. The flannel material found on Adam's body was the exact match to the material on the chainsaw blade. Now that Wilda knew Howard had killed the teens, she truly believed it had been Howard that had killed her uncle too. During their recorded conversation, he had finally told her where Sam's body could be located. After finally finding Sam's body, his hands and head had been missing just like Adam's. She decided to talk to Howard once again because there was no way that she was going to bury her uncle's body without his head. After talking to Howard, he told her that she needed to go back out into the woods where she had found his body and just take a camera in order to take pictures and then bring the pictures back to him and he could tell her where Sam's skull was buried. After Wilda had the pictures developed, she noticed something very odd. In a lot of the pictures, it was as if there were outlines of skulls that she could locate in the landscapes of the pictures. She felt that it was her uncle's spirit leading them straight to his skull. On one of the last pictures she had taken, a skull was looking down onto a rock below. And after lifting the rock, they were able to locate Sam's skull buried underneath that rock. Even though the murders happened in 2002, Howard's trial did not start until 2010. And he was finally sentenced to death for the murders of Adam and Samantha. His mother, Betty Willis, was also charged with aiding and abetting her son. But she died before a conviction could even be made. At his trial, Willis later tried to pin the murders on his mother because, of course, isn't that what all good sons would do? The motive for the murders remain unclear, but the investigators believe that Howard was involved with the newlyweds from various drug deals And, of course, the families of the victims believe this is not true. Which I suppose, in the end, a motive does not matter because nothing could have been enough of an excuse to take two teenagers' lives. He remains on death row today and has tried several times to get this decision overturned. He is claiming that he did not murder the young couple. He was never tried for his stepfather Sam's murder. It is believed that Howard also murdered his first wife and maybe additional individuals from his past. I do feel that at least two victims didn't get complete justice and maybe additional victims. Where is Debbie? I just believe that there's some more people out there and they know more than we have heard. And all I'm asking them just to please contact somebody. That was Lauren Havlin reporting. Nancy Deborah Willis's family needs answers. If you have any information about her disappearance, you need to call the Bradley County Sheriff's Office, that number right there at the bottom of your screen. So although it has never been proven that Howard is a serial killer, his ex-wife believes that he is. Do you believe that there are more bodies located in Boon Lake or Lookout Mountain where Sam's body was found? I don't know. Kind of weird. Thank you for joining me at the Murder She Shed. I love you guys, and I hope y'all have a blessed week, and I hope y'all had a great Thanksgiving. I did, and I got a nice little break, and it was amazing. Well, I love y'all. Bye. Now smash that sexy subscribe button, and you won't be disappointed. Now smash that sexy dis- not describe button. On that note, let's just keep Right on moving along, okay? They were inside eating pizza, pizza and hut, pizza, pizza in the hut, pizza in the hut. What the heck's pizza?
bits in the head. I, I think he was a bit crazy myself, and I think you get that crazy from his mom. It ran straight down in that family. I guess crazy does run down sometimes. I mean, I'd be a bit crazy, but Lord mercy, I'm not that crazy. Uh-uh, no. I'm going to go around doing that stuff. That like button is sure needing your attention. You should push it before you leave. Push it real good. Every time my husband hears that song, Beautiful Crazy by Luke Combs, he says, that's you. Which I'm not sure if that's a compliment or not. I guess it's a half-half there, so I guess I should be proud of the fact he at least thinks I'm beautiful, right? My little nephew, when I went down for Thanksgiving, he wanted me to play dinosaurs with him. And uh, he said he liked the way I play it because I play crazy. If my little nephew knows I'm crazy, then that's probably a sure sign that you are. I have to record this whole thing over again. Here's my little Jomo. He he missed me while I was gone. I left him here when I went to my mom's for Thanksgiving. He had to stay with his daddy because my husband didn't go. He had to work and stuff. So he missed his mama. He was ready to see her, wasn't it, buddy? Mm -hmm. Oh, here comes Max, too. Oh, boy, y'all are big old boys. Y'all too big to act that way.